congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee those humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, and preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfailingly thankful, that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost will honour and glory, world without end. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and thus promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, that thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, and may it be most expedient for them. Grant him us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. This hymn that we are about to sing in our hearts uh, to God, before we uh, uh, hear Reverend Dr. John Dixon uh, speak on Psalm 116 and Psalm 116 verse 12 in particular. Uh, this hymn was written by John Newton. Of course, John Newton is the former slave trader who came to know Jesus Christ late in life. It's never too late. He came to know Jesus Christ late in life and uh, he wrote this for his friend, the Reverend Richard Johnson, before he sailed with the first fleet in 1787. Would you please stand? Very different occasions from one another. We are commemorating the quite serious celebration of the first Christian service. But the very first European ceremony was, of course, the one of comparison. It was shambolic, laconic, and involved lots of fear, you may know. Some say it was increasingly Australian. You know the story. The first fleet arrived at Ockney Bay uh, around the 20th of January, and uh, despite their best efforts, could not find the wonderful meadows surrounding the harbour that Captain James Cook had promised. So they decided to give up on Botany Bay, despite the hymns being written for the occasion, and sailed a few miles north to what Governor Arthur Phillip described in his official dispatch as the finest harbour in the world. Sydney Harbour, Lord Jackson. And as the 11 ships in the first fleet sailed up the harbour on the 26th of January. Apparently, indigenous locals lined the shores on both sides, shouting, waving their spears. Perhaps they were the only ones who knew what a mixed occasion this really would be. But around midday on the 26th of January, a small group of officers and marines rowed ashore at uh, approximately Circular Key, raised the Union Jack, let off several rounds of gunfire, drank four rounds of beer, we are told, ostensibly in honour of different members of the royal family, and then gave a loud three cheers, which was returned by the ships. And just so, one officer reported, the new town was christened. There was nothing religious about that christening of uh, the colony in uh, 1788, on the 26th of January. 
There was no prayer, there was no Bible, there was no hymn singing, there was just fear and noise. We don't really know what the chaplain to the colony, Richard Johnson, thought about that first European ceremony, but I can imagine he was a little disappointed with the irreligion of the occasion, especially as they decided not to have a church service the next day, the Sunday, because disembarkation would be too busy. And so the first church service was stalled for the next Sunday. But whatever his disappointments at the beginning, there was worse to come for the Reverend Richard Johnson. Johnson was, in fact, something of an afterthought from the uh, Home Office. He only got the uh, appointment because of the advocacy of John Newton, uh, who wrote Nathan Rest, and his friend William Wilberforce, uh, the, the great anti-slavery campaigner. But Johnson himself surely doesn't rank among those two giants of 18th century Christianity. But Johnson was, just like those two, an Anglican evangelical. And Anglican evangelicals, once upon a time, saw their role as holistic, not just a spiritual affair, but also caring for the people in their church. And Johnson was a passionate preacher. There's good evidence of that. But did you know he was also the colony's best farmer and was very happy to teach uh, many people uh, the farming practices that he gained from England and uh, was key to the economy. He and his wife, Mary, as you may know, were also in charge of schooling in the first uh, 10 years. They taught over 150 children together in those early years before they handed it over to Thomas Tabor in 1797 as the first teacher of the colony. And he is uh, remembered in the plaque over on the wall to your right. Johnson famously engaged with the convicts and the officers alike. And as Justin intimated, he refused to play the role of moral policeman, which is what we know successive governors wanted the chaplains to do. He was also an early model of peace and friendship with the First Nations people. We know how wrong it went, how quickly. But Johnson himself advocated building mutual trust. He and Mary, in fact, adopted an indigenous orphan into their own family. They named their own daughter Milba, an Aboriginal word they had picked up. And on one occasion, Richard Johnson himself was human collateral. He had to uh, go out and uh, be guarded by Eora warriors, while Benelon, the Eora leader, met with Governor Arthur Phillip. Johnson happily did it, trusting those new relationships. It's also worth mentioning that Johnson was tireless in his efforts among the sick and dying. Against all the advice, Johnson went and would visit the putrid hulls sitting there in the harbour where they usually left sick convicts to die and then get rid of them. But Johnson would go day after day to care for the sick and dying. In fact, during the Great Famine of 1790, one convict wrote home these words. Few of the sick would recover if it were not for the kindness of the Reverend Mr. Johnson, whose assistance out of his own stores makes him the physician, both of soul and body. On matters of the soul, Johnson fought an uphill battle, you may know. His relationship with the first governor, Arthur Phillip, was uh, cordial, but not uh, warm. We know that Arthur Phillip uh, wanted Johnson to deal with, quote, moral subjects in his sermons, because he wanted the convicts to be good boys and girls. He wanted to, uh, to avoid all that evangelical salvation and stuff. And so it's ironic, and I ask you to pause on this thought, that at the founding of this country, 
the government wanted the church to do more moralizing. When Arthur Philip left the colony in 1792, the real problems for Johnson potted up because the interim governor was Major uh, Francis Gross, and he displayed open contempt for Richard Johnson. To get church out of the way, uh, Gross ordered that church should start at 6 a.m. and should take no longer than 45 minutes. And more than once, uh, Gross ordered his soldiers to attention in the middle of Johnson's sermon and marched in and out. For five years, Johnson petitioned the government to dedicate or uh, construct a dedicated building for church services. And they said no. Uh, they had built schools and hospitals and pubs and houses and shops and did I mention the pubs? Lots of things and no church. Eventually, Johnson decided to build it himself, out of his own uh, money in 1793, but for a cost of £67.12, shillings, according to the record. It lasted five years before being burned down in suspicious circumstances. Then it would be another ten years before they built a replacement. And all of this is the history of this parish, which is a delight to be here in this moment, in this place. With all this as background, I want to take you to the second European ceremony on our shores, the first Christian church service on the first Sunday following the disembarkation, the 3rd of February, 1788. It was a solemn affair compared to the beer drinking one a week or so earlier. John uh, Johnson set up under a great tree 600 meters from here. I just did a Google check before I got up. 600 <laughs> meters that way. And he laid out on a table his books, his prayer book sitting on the desk there, and his Bible right here in front of me. The entire colony was present. And as you know, on the corner of Bly and Hunter Streets, the spot is marked. The entire colony is present. That's uh, 800 convicts or thereabouts, and 200 or so Marines with family members. What can Tench, the First Fleet officer, wrote in his uh, famous journal about the occasion, the behavior of both the officers and the convicts was equally regular and attentive. In other words, everyone listened intently as Johnson opened this Bible and announced the reading. The 116th Psalm, 12th verse. What idea would he choose to mark the beginning of the colony? Of a nation. We know what the authorities wanted. One of the thou shalt not passages would be just fitting for the occasion. But we know Johnson chose these words. What you see on the screen there is what I see in front of me right here. By the way, those funny F looking symbols are actually S's at the front of the middle of words. How they printed essays uh, before the year 1800. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Or as the modern translation puts it, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? At one level, what an odd text. On this occasion, uh, the 800 convicts in Johnson's audience had spent eight long months in the putrid holes of these ships. Uh, the goodness and benefits of the Lord were probably not uppermost in mind. Have another level. I think it was a fantastic text to launch a new colony. 
For starters, the convicts must have breathed a sigh of relief that it wasn't one of the Thou shalt not passages. And in any case, we know that there was a sense of amazement amongst the first believers that there was so little death and hardship in the first belief itself. And so there was a sense that something miraculous had taken place, that there had been benefits of the Lord. But there's a far more important reason. This is the perfect verse to choose. The question in this text takes us to the heart of what is unique in the Christian faith. Sadly, we don't have a text of the sermon itself that Richard Johnson preached. But we do know he chose this text deliberately because it was not one of the texts set down in the prayer book for the 3rd of February. So he thought about it and chose this text. We also have one long sermon from Richard Johnson, um, published four years after he landed here for the whole colony, where he laid out what he thought was the most important message he had to tell the colony. So we know what made this man tick. We don't have to guess what Johnson was getting at by saying, what shall I render or give back to the Lord for all his benefits? Because this verse captures Christianity's central contribution to the history of ideas. I put it this way, that Christianity is about gratitude in response to God's gifts, not morality in pursuit of reward. I'm going to say that again because it's so the opposite of how our world thinks. Christianity is about gratitude in response to God's gifts, not morality in pursuit of reward. And so many areas of life, then and today, the principle we operate on is Performance brings reward. It starts in childhood, at school. Kids say to one another, if you do this for me, I'll be your best friend. When they start to join sports teams, they realize that only performance brings the rewards. In academics, it's true. In the business world, it is true. You perform, you'll be promoted. Make a mistake, watch out. And people take this performance reward mentality into religion and think that you have to do things, perform rituals, do rules, and God will reward you with his benefits. And in a way, that was the message Arthur Philip and Gross would have liked Johnson to preach because it is a message of control. If I can convince you of the carrot or the stick, I can control you. Johnson wouldn't have a bar of Johnson preached what theologians call the doctrines of grace. What his friend John Newton called amazing grace in that song he wrote 18 years before all this. Moralizing religion asks the question, what shall I perform for the Lord to earn his benefits? Christianity asks, what shall I render, give back to the Lord for all his benefits already received? The Christian life isn't motivated by reward or punishment. It's motivated by gratitude for the benefits the grace already received. And the reason this is so important to Christianity is that Jesus' death paid the price for our wrongs. And so the thought that I can outdo my wrongs through my performance is an insult to the death of Jesus. All of this is what Richard Johnson was thinking when he chose those 13 words to kick off the Christian history of this colony. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? Me? And 
And indeed, the next verse gives the answer to the question. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. In other words, how do we respond to the benefits and grace of God? We take hold of His salvation. We call on Him as our Lord. If we had time, I would read you the entire pamphlet we have from 1792, which Johnson wrote uh, for the colony as his um, major statement of what his ministry was about. And if anyone has a handy $30,000, there is a first edition copy of The pamphlet is all about taking hold of the salvation of the Lord and calling on his name. I won't read it to you, but I can't resist the opening sentence and the closing sentence to give you a sense of this man. Remember, he is writing to convicts and servants and officers. Your souls are precious. You are precious to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are precious in my esteem. It goes on for the length of a full sermon, a good old fashioned full sermon, not one of these modern homilies. And it ends This will be my daily prayer to God for you, your eternal salvation. All of that must have been present in his first sermon. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? May I leave Johnson for a moment and look at things from the perspective of one of the convicts sitting under the great tree 233 years ago today. At 19 years of age, Samuel Payton was caught in London in possession of a stolen watch, which he said he won at a card game. It didn't wash. And in 1785, he was sentenced to seven years transportation. In May 1787, he found himself chained in the hull of the Alexander on his way to Sydney. He arrived eight months later and was set to work as a stonemason, supporting the flurry of building activity, the hospital, the prison, the pubs, the governor's house, and so on. Within five months, we know that Samuel Payton was in trouble again. This time, and I quote from the official record, found in an officer's quarters, stealing a shirt, stockings, and a comb. I get the impression Samuel Payton was foolhardy, not quite pure evil. The young man was promptly tried and sentenced on the Monday. And then on the Wednesday, 25th of June, 1788, he was hanged on Sydney's public gallows, 450 metres that way, behind the Four Seasons Hotel. He died at 21 years of age. Now, Payton would just be another name in the convict log, were it not for a letter he wrote to his mother the night before his hand. We had it. It's remarkable. He opens by saying to his mother, he's writing this letter with the assistance of a commiserating friend. Who was the commiserating friend? We don't know. It could well have been Richard Johnson himself, because we know it was Johnson's habit and duty to go all the way with convicts to their point of death. And the letter reads like the young Peyton had fully absorbed the messages of salvation that Richard Johnson preached. Let me read to you. Just parts of the letter. 
My dear mother, with what agony of soul do I dedicate the few last moments of my life to bid you an eternal farewell. My doom being fixed, ere this hour tomorrow I shall have entered into an endless eternity. I will not distress your tender maternal feelings by any long comments on the cause of my present misfortune. Let it therefore suffice to say that I have fallen at length an unhappy, though just victim, to my own faults. Too late I regret my inattention to your admonitions. I feel myself sensibly affected by the remembrance of the many anxious moments you have passed on my account. For these and all my other transgressions, however great, I supplicate the divine forgiveness. And encouraged by the promises of that Saviour who died for us all, I trust to receive that mercy in the world to come which my offences have deprived me of in this. Banish from your memory all my former indiscretions. Let the cheering hope of a happy meeting hereafter console you for my loss. Then he closes. Sincerely penitent for my sins. Sensible of the justice of my conviction and sentence, and firmly relying on the merits of a blessed redeemer, I trust I shall yet experience that peace which this world can give me. Your unhappy loan son, Sammy Payton, Port Jackson, New South Wales, 24 June, 17. Hayden's letter captures perfectly the heart of Christianity. Not performance, but grace. Hayden wasn't in those moments thinking about what he might do to earn the benefits of the Lord. The letter is all about trusting the promises of the Saviour who died for us all about firmly relying on the merits of a blessed redeemer, he says. You know, his death is mentioned in several journals from 1788. We know it was a cold, wet, squally June day. At 11.30 a.m., the 21-year-old mounted the gallows and made what one witness describes as, quote, an eloquent and well-directed speech, admitting guilt and asking for forgiveness. He died penitent, wrote another witness. I say he died in the grace and the benefits of the Lord. Friends, from the first days of modern Australia, the Christian emphasis was not morality, but Christ. The news that Christ died for petty criminals like Samuel Payton and the thief on the cross next to Jesus, for earnest priests like Richard Johnson, even for moralizing authoritarians like Major Gross, as well as for neglectful materialists, bankers, atheists, and even the smugly religious. He died and rose for us all. This, friends, was the first doctrine preached in Australia. It is the most important doctrine. What shall I render unto the Lord? For all his benefits toward me, I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. That was the message.
that launch our young nation. Lord, these 233 years later, write this word in our hearts and in the hearts of Australians everywhere. Convince us, Lord, not of mere morality, but of your abundant benefits in the salvation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Before we sing our final song, come forward, Kevin. Just a couple of what nexts for us. What nexts? If any of you heard in John's message just a moment ago, especially about eternal salvation, uh, has interested you, uh, then we invite you to join John Dixon in a four week course, Tuesdays in March, every Tuesday in March. It's called The Life of Jesus Course, and you'll hear from John's lips down at the Garrison Church uh, about the life of Jesus from Luke's Gospel. You read the Gospel, you'll be able to read it with adult eyes, asking adult questions, and to do so with John in the room. To find out about that, get in touch with our office, and we'll let you know more about that. That's the life of Jesus, of course. What next if you're interested in the prayer book that you've just heard today? Well, every Tuesday in Lent, it starts in two weeks' time, Ash Wednesday, 17th of February, every Tuesday in Lent at 7.30 in the morning, that's major gross time. Every Tuesday in Lent, the East Plus Prayer Book Society puts on this morning prayer in short homily. And if you'd, like, if you'd like to join us and you're able to do so, do that. That's interested in the prayer book. And the third thing is if you're interested in history, you want to take a next step. Well, then you can join us at the table after the service. Most of you will leave fairly quickly for COVID reasons and gather outside where you can take your mask off. But some of you might like to look at these Bible and prayer book with a long to Richard Johnson, as well as communion silver from King George III, who was given, given to the colony in the early 19th century, a Geneva Bible, as well as what is most likely the Reverend Richard Johnson's first communion cup in Australia. And that'll be at the table after the service, where there's this light. Can I ask you to gather with distance between you and no more than three behind the rail at any specific time? Which might mean if you'd like to see it, then it's going to take a little bit of time to do so, but you'll need to be patient as that takes place. There's some things that you might like to do after the service. Would you please stand as we thank you? the peace of God, which passes of all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and our Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Because how you know, you never see these people who write this book, you know? You don't know who is the writer. Would you trust them? It was 200 years ago, and you know? they're all dead now. Yeah, we can trust them. You should trust them? There's plenty of alcohol. So. It, was a, it, it was a four ounce of beer. Yeah, I think it was a bit more than four ounces. Yeah, it probably was 24.